Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So we're reading from the first canto, chapter 1, text 10. Prayenalpayusa sabya Kalavasmin yuge janaha Mandasumanda matayo Matabhagya hupadrutaha This is an environmental scan of where we are now. Translation. O learned one, in this iron age of Kali, men have but short lives. They are quarrelsome, lazy, misguided, unlucky, and above all, always disturbed. And one of Prabhupada's classic purports. The devotees of the Lord are always anxious for the spiritual improvement of the general public. When the sages at Naimasharanya analyzed the state of affairs of the people in the sage of Kali, they foresaw that men would live short lives. In Kali Yuga, the duration of life is shortened, not so much because of insufficient food, but because of irregular habits. By keeping regular habits and eating simple food, any man can maintain his health. Overeating, over-sense gratification, over-dependence on another's mercy, and artificial standards of life sap the very vitality of the human energy. Therefore, the duration of life shortened. People in the age of Kali are also very lazy, not only materially, but in the matter of self-realization. The human life is especially meant for self-realization. That is to say, man should come to know what he is, what the world is, and what the supreme truth is. Human life is, is a means by which the living entity can end all misery of the hard struggle of life in material existence, and by which he can return to Godhead, his eternal home. But, due to a bad system of education, men have no desire for self-realization. Even if they do come to know about it, they unfortunately become victims of misguided teachers. There's only two paragraphs left. In this age, men are victims not only of different political creeds and parties, this is one of my favorite sentences, but also many different types of sense gratificatory diversions, such as cinemas, sports, gambling, clubs, mundane libraries, bad association, smoking, drinking, cheating, pilfering, bickering, and so on. Sounds like a great place, doesn't it? Their, mi huh? Their minds are always disturbed and are full of anxiety due to so many different engagements. In this age, many unscrupulous men manufacture their own religious faiths, which are not based on any revealed scripture. And very often, people, are addicted to sense, people who are addicted to sense gratification are attracted by such institutions. Just as a sidelight, when the devotees first went to Italy, a small temple in Rome, early 70s, nobody spoke Italian. They had an apartment. It was packed, chanting, De che be, okay, lindo, che prezioso. Goodbye, my little friend. Um, everyone was having a great time. Donna, uh, I forget the name of the devotee, who arrived from England, spoke Italian, gave the Sunday feast, ended his talk, three-fourths of the audience walked out. They said, what did you say? I mean, did you offend the Italian mother? Or what? This kid is going to go off, guaranteed. It's only a matter of time. So, you got three shots, my friend. No, no, no. We started, he gets a clean slate starting now. Um, but I am counting. Thank you. So anyway, what did you say? And uh, he said, I explained the four regular principles. So as soon as they heard the four regular principles, what, they'd never heard that before. So anyway, people are attached to sense. They have so many ideas what a religion life is. Okay, where were we? Uh, all right. Um, no, no, we're there. Uh, consequently, in the name of religion, so many sinful acts are carried on that people in general have neither peace of, peace of mind or health of body. The student brahmachari communities are no longer being maintained, and householders don't observe the rules and regulations of Gihasta ashram. Consequently, the so-called varna process and sannyasis who come out of such Gihasta ashrams are easily deviated from the rigid path. In Kali Yuga, the whole atmosphere is surcharged with faithlessness. Men are, are, men are no longer just in spiritual values. Material sense gratification is now the standard of civilization. For the maintenance of such material civilizations, men have formed complex nations and communities, and there's a constant strain of hot and cold war between these different groups. 
It has become very difficult, therefore, to raise the spiritual standard due to the present distorted values of human society. The sages of Naimishirani are anxious to dis- were anxious to disentangle all the fallen souls, and here they are seeking the remedy from Srila Sutta Goswami. I mean, you could give class for a month on this. It is such a Prabhupada's profound vision. They say that if you're standing at the bottom of a mountain and looking up, all you can see is some rocks, some trees. You can see maybe 20, 30 yards in front of you. If you're standing on the mountain looking down, you can see the whole mountain, all the trees, all the rocks. You can see the person at the base trying to look up. You can see the plains and all the other mountain ranges. So someone who's Trilochan, who's a saintly, self-realized person, they can see everything because they're seeing through the eyes of Shastra and Krishna's enlightening within the heart. So here we have the actual situation of things. The presentation given is that uh, human civilization is progressive. That each generation builds up a body of knowledge and hands the torch of knowledge onto the next generation, which builds and illuminates further the path of knowledge. And that it's such hubris. The presentation is that we are the apex of human civilization. One man said, one man said to Prabhupada about evolution from monkeys. Prabhupada said, What's the evolution? You're still monkeys. <laughs> huh? So what's so really, you know, Prabhupada said you can put a dog on a throne and you throw a shoe in front of the dog will jump off and go for the shoe. So they may have their big, tall buildings, and they may have their push-button this and that, and they're also, but in the core of their heart, what's changed? What are they actually, you know, eating, sleeping, mating, and defending? And even low class. Here it's describing how a human being should do it. So this presentation that we are the apex of civilization and we're progressing is just uh, the height of Kali Yuga arrogance. And they have no standard to measure against. So... And I was thinking, Prabhupada was saying one time, he was saying about opulence. People were saying, Prabhupada was making this point uh, uh, of how real knowledge and real culture has been lost and is found in the Vedic tradition. And they said, but Prabhupada, but it's so opulent. This, you know, we're so opulent. Prabhupada says, what is your opulence? He said, your opulence is glass and plastic. Plastic you can't even clean. And then Prabhupada said, and even then you don't have the opulence of one moment's peace of mind. So we wanted to talk about that, what the real opulence is, peace of mind. Because here it's saying they're always, above all, the the cornerstone uh, uh, permeating the entire atmosphere of Kali Yuga is people are always disturbed. So the opposite of disturbance is that they actually have peace of mind. So what does that mean? Um... A little more just because of the time factor about where we're at. Because diagnosis of a disease is 90% of the cure. And unless we understand our condition, we're not going to be willing to be trained. I'm going to get to that point in a minute. But, there, but a little humility. Prabhupada gives the example of um, if there's a teacher, a music teacher, let's say, and he asks uh, student A, have you ever studied piano before? Student says, no, no, I don't, I don't know a thing. And student B says, oh, yes, I've been I've self-taught. I've been practicing for three or four years, teaching myself. Now, which student will the teacher charge more? The one who doesn't know anything or the one who's already, already got some experience? What? The one who has experience. Are you, is that your final answer? Or do we have a counter answer? Yes, Prabhu. Oh, you're on board with him. Well, there's a stone boat. The one who doesn't know anything. What? Because the teacher says, I have to break all your bad habits. Start over fresh. The other man is a clean slate. You've got all kinds of wrong, you've wrong habits. So I have to start fresh. So that humility of willing to start fresh. I remember one of the first things, one of the devotees, one devotee I met. <laughs> well, first thing, first devotee I met, uh, I was living in Laguna Beach where the sun is always shining and the sea breezes are blowing and I had a youthful body and thought life was great. I had the whole, I just had to stay on the conveyor belt and everything was going to unfold in front of me. And in my, you think I'm arrogant now, you should have seen me then. Now, I forget what I said to the devotee, but obviously I, you know, he understood my arrogant nature. And the devotee turned to me and said, you know one thing about this world though? I said, what's that? He said, nobody, get, nobody gets out alive. I thought, you know, Guy's got a point, you know. It's one of the first things. And then another, that was Shukadev told me that. Then another devotee told me, uh, 
he, he said, I said, how did you become a devotee? He said, I became a self-realized fool. And I thought, you know, that doesn't, he doesn't mean like a babbling idiot. What does he actually mean? You know, so I inquired. He said, I realized I don't know anything. I said, I, what do I actually know about anything? So the um, Prabhupada came to Detroit. Um, and in the defense of the devotees, Prabhupada was supposed to go to Toronto, then Dallas, then Detroit. But there was the chance of getting Deva Sadan Mandir, the temple there. So Prabhupada came early. You know, Prabhupada knew, Prabhupada could sense a good opportunity. Immediately Prabhupada arrived on the scene. And uh, so we thought we had 10 days. All of a sudden we had three days to get everything ready. So you know all the painting. Hari Sari said that Prabhupada would, would open the door to where he was staying on a regular basis take a breath and turn to Hari Sari. At Shruti Kirti told me the same thing. Prabhupada would say, fresh paint. You know, the devotee said, just paint it, you know. Well, I mean, when Prabhupada came to Detroit, literally we were handing the paint buckets out the kitchen window as Prabhupada was coming in the front door, you know. So, uh, none of the devotees had slept. That was my point uh, in, in a couple of days. Prabhupada came for the morning class, sat down to give Bhagavatam class. Actually, he was reading from Chaitanya Charitamrita. And we had three or four bus parties there. There must have been 400, 500 devotees. And practically to a man, woman, and child, everyone was asleep. Just, just you know, calm. Because the first time they'd sat down, you know, and they were just out cold. So Prabhupada was reading from Chaitanya Charitamrita because it had just come out. And Prabhupada was reading a section where it's describing the causeless mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And the analogy is that a poor man doesn't become rich unless something extraordinary, out of the ordinary course of events happens. He gets some inheritance. He finds gold on the road. Something extraordinary has to happen. So Prabhupada said, in the same way, this movement is going on by the mercy of Krishna alone. And then he looked out over his glasses like a loving and knowing grandfather, chuckled to himself, turned to Hari Sari and said, that is a fact. Because he saw all the devotees sound asleep. And he also told us later on sitting in his room, Prabhupada said, he said that uh, he, he was talking about the efficacy that's there uh, in the Krishna consciousness movement and the desire of the previous acharyas. And Prabhupada said that, that Yudhisthira Maharaj, Prabhupada's actual words, where he was being hunted in the forest like an animal, you know, hiding and like that. He said he was being hunted in the forest like an animal. And within 18 days, Yudhisthira Maharaj was emperor of the world. Prabhupada said, in the same way, Krishna will give you the whole world in 18 days. And then Prabhupada stopped. Why 18 days? 18 hours. And then Prabhupada said, but what will you do with it? Simply sleep. So we should be conscious of our own selves and the atmosphere that we're in. And, and just as a sidelight to, to finish up the thing, uh, there's a devotee who comes to the temple in San Diego. Uh, he's a friend, a comes, you know, congregation guy. And he has a crew of people that pick up along the road, you know, what they, like Caltrans, they call it California Transportation. You know? They pick up, you know, he supervises the maintenance on the highways. And they have a crew, usually prisoners, that go out and pick up trash, you know, on the road. And he says on a regular basis, they get daily, and his route alone, 10 to 12 cell phones that have been thrown out the window. They call it chuckers. People have chucked their phone because they're so angry. You know, their girlfriend is given a bad time or the stock is, whatever it is, something. And they're so angry, they've just thrown the phone out. So imagine how agitated you must be to just chuck your phone. And then people will call an hour or two later, hey, did you find my cell phone? You know, by the way, you know. So people are always agitated. They're so lazy. I mean, what's the easiest thing? You have a trouble in marriage, get divorced. You have a trouble with it, you get pregnant, just kill the baby in the womb. I never knew this. My sister told me this, my older sister. I never knew this. And, you know, when you get towards the, you know, you start seeing life is, is coming to an end point, you tend to become a little more thoughtful. So she knows that, you know, I'm a devotee and we've talked. So she came to me and she said, she said, you know, I have a dream. She said, this dream I have couple times a year, I have a small boy who comes to me, five, six-year-old boy, and says, why did you kill me? She had an abortion, which I never knew. She said, she said, whether it's psychosomatic, whether it's a ghost, who knows? But she was, you know, because 
college girl. She had just gotten married. They were both in college, didn't want to spend the, you know, the, you know, that stop their career, raise a child, all the expense. What's the easiest thing to do? Everyone pressured her. She had an abortion. And it haunts her to this day as a sidelight. And it's a lot of people are like that, actually. A lot of, I've, she was telling me that there's other, she said there's a, what do you call it, a support group and all that kind of stuff. So, and what this, so they're lazy, lazy and everything, just to eat, just to cook nice food. It's in their own self-interest. But everything's pre packed We know, microwave, this, that, zip, one minute, so many different things, you know. So such is the atmosphere we're in. And we should recognize it. The... Well, there's another man who comes to the, actually comes to the Laguna Temple. And he joined the army a couple years ago. Because he thought, hey, free education, right? What do you got? You got to march around, wear green. I can live with that, you know, no problem. Get up early in the morning. You lose a few pounds. <laughs> cheaper than, you know. There was no war in Iraq at the time. So he joined the army. He thought, hey, you know, put in my four years. Get my college paid for. It's all right. No big deal. But the thing is that he fought with his drill sergeant. Because, you know, the guy, those guys are heavy. And, and he fought it, and he was always being punished and peeling potatoes and painting everything. And, and they just they were in lock, you know, uh, locked horns again and again and again. And he was miserable. He was thinking, how can I get out of this thing, get dishonorable discharge? I, just, I, I, I can't deal with this guy anymore. Then the war in Iraq started. And he realized, I'm going to be sent overseas where people are, you know, a determined enemy is trying to blow my head off. Maybe I should listen to what this guy has to say. And he realized that the man, what the man was telling him, he, that, that drill sergeant became his new best friend. Because he said, this is the man who's going to keep me alive. If I learn, and he, just, and he said, as, he said, as soon as I got, it hit me like a blinding flash. And as soon as I just, whatever he told me, I just did it. Whatever training, because I said, hey, I don't want to get my head blown off. And they became best of friends. And the whole experience, they completely changed. So if we realize, Prabhupada gives the example of why, here's another quiz question, why does the potter need the clay? You know, you see him needing the, before they make, do anything, you see him working and working and working the clay. They're working out their angst. It's, you know, some kind of tactile therapy. What are they doing? What's the reason? Soft, okay, that's a good guess. Anyone know? Why, yeah, why do they work the clay? Sorry. I'm sorry, I need, I'm sorry. Yeah, why? <laughs> Mahatap was very intelligent. He works on several planes, so he was thinking need, need. He had four different translations. No, uh, to work it, you know, to get the air out. Why? Ah, very good. Because when you heat it up, the air expands and the pot will crack. So Prabhupada says at the time of death, you know, what everything we do is tested. So, or, or in the time of stress, things are tested. So the spiritual master has a duty to actually need the student. So the simple point I'm trying to make is that um, there has to be, if we want to get free from always being disturbed, there has to be a certain humility. And that humility means a willingness to hear from the spiritual master, and take the instructions on board. There's a, another thing I was thinking about. Uh, these are Because I want to talk about some of the gifts that come from Krishna consciousness, but the other thing I was going to say is that they need to see devotees, because people are living in this environment if you don't have an alternative. Mahatma has heard this before, but he's tolerant. The, um, I took one devotee, a nice young brahmachari. And to get health insurance, you have to go to the, it was in Michigan, you have to go to the Michigan, whatever, health services, you know. And it's one of those huge welfare offices, and there's crying babies, and the person behind the counter has, you know, got thick glass and filling out 50 forms, and you know they want to be somewhere else, right? And they don't even look up. You just slide the form under, and they check the boxes like that, you know. So in order to qualify, you have to give your list of assets. So this nice young brahmachari, He's, you know, bank balance, zero. Savings, zero. I mean, everything was zero. They asked, burial plot, zero. Car, zero. Gold fillings, zero. And he had all his teeth. Every, the whole list was zero, zero, zero. And then he gives you the total at the end, you know, zero. 
So, you know, the bing, next, they're taking the numbers, you know, and the lady's not even looking up. She's the, and he slides the form, you know, under the window through the glass. She looks at it, and you see you're just going down, and she's, you know, completely deadpanned in somewhere else. And then all of a sudden, you see her looking, zero. And she, like, how is it possible? And then she's used to looking up, and there's some toothless, you know, decrepit, totally dependent person, you know, drooling and just feed me, feed me, you know. And she looks up and she sees this, you know, obviously happy, effulgent, intelligent, healthy, competent person. And you could just see that does not compute because she was looking at the form is a zero. And yet here is this person who's obviously happier than I am with nothing that I have. So, and in a similar way, a few years ago, we were doing Harinam downtown San Diego, New Year's Eve chanting and dancing, nice Sankatan party. I happened to be towards the front. This man came out of this one restaurant. It's interesting because right in front of it is a cigar store. We're way off track, but we'll get back. There's this guy, they always sit out there and they're smoking these cigars and they think they're too cool for you, you know? And, but the funny thing is you watch the devotees go by and these cigars smell so bad. I've seen it happen repeatedly. The devotees will go by smell and they'll look at their shoe like, oh, did they step in something, you know? <laughs> So the guy's thinking he's very cool. And then you'll see, you know, three or four people looking at their shoe like, what's the horrible smell? And they actually become a little embarrassed, they're a little chagrined that they're not, you know. But anyway, we went past this one restaurant. And this man comes out in a tuxedo. And he handed me a $100 bill. I said, thank you very much, sir. And for why? And he said, I'll tell you. He said, I'm sitting in that restaurant with my wife and four other couples. And he said, you know, dinner for one person, you add wine and whatever it is, it's going to be a couple hundred dollars. One person. He said, so our table alone is going to be about three or $4,000, just the, our dinner tab. He said, from that, we're going over to the Grant Hotel where they have, you know, you can buy for $500, $1,000, you buy a ticket to the New Year's thing. You know, he said, by the time it's all over, our party will have spent about $10,000 for this evening. He said, and that restaurant is full of people, groups and couples, doing the same thing. He said, and you know what? He said, you guys, pointing to the devotees, he said, you're the only ones who are happy. And given my nature, I said, you know what, sir? I said, we're doing it for free, you know? <laughs> so the, the simple point I'm trying to make is that the people are, in the age of Kali, there's a progression. People are thinking that conditions are going to make them happy. But the fact of the matter is we have no control over conditions. There's conditions and there's a response to conditions. Which do we have control over? Conditions and the response to the conditions. Actually, we have, on one hand, we can select to put ourselves in a particular place, but whether it rains, whether it snows, whether, you know, ultimately what happens, we don't have control over conditions but we have control over how we respond to conditions. It's described that the path of life, well, I'll set it up like this. Baholasva in, when did we go to? Baholasva in um, Vrindavan. Prabhupada actually said his Gayatri pretty quickly you know, with his focused, fixed intelligence. So Prabhupada came out, sat in the darshan room, and he was saying his Gayatri. So the voice said, well, let me say Gayatri with Srila Prabhupada. You know, and it's a natural thing. So, so Balas was singing, concentrating on every single syllable. And Prabhupada, you know, with full focus and devotion, zipped through his, uh, through his Gayatri and got up to walk. So Baholasva finished and then ran to catch up with Srila Prabhupada. But to catch up, he didn't have time to get his shoes. And, you know, they were first going on that, now it's Bhaktivedanta Marg before he got on the Parikram path. And that, you know, it's cold in the morning, so many sticks, glass, so many things, you know. Prabhupada, who did not miss a thing, Prabhupada looked down at Baholasva and said, where are your shoes? Baholasva replied, he said, oh, Prabhupada, when I'm with you, I don't feel any pain, you know, offered some flowery words. Prabhupada, you know, who had heard it all before, Prabhupada looked and said, there's enough misery in life without inventing it, go get your shoes. <laughs> so the, just like Prahlad Marsh says, misery comes unsought, you know. But the point is that the, the analogy in the Bhagavatam is that the path of life has so many sticks and rocks and difficulties. What to speak of in the age of color? Lazy, misguided, unlucky, and always disturbed. 
But the shoes, just, just the analogy is you put on shoes, you can traverse the path. So transcendental knowledge is considered the, tra- the shoes that help us traverse the path of life. So as the symptom, it says especially, it highlights, underlines the symptom in Kali Yuga is that people are always disturbed. I thought I would talk briefly about two antidotes or two uh, uh, components of the shoes that help one deal with this always disturbed. The first is the, the and actually I was thinking about it because of Vaisha Sheikh, and I was thinking it's called the gift of the gap is what I was thinking. And by gift of the gap, what do I mean? I mean that separation from myself and the senses and my circumstances. That is a profound gift. There was a devotee, underage, who joined the Hare Krishna movement. It doesn't happen so much anymore, but it used to happen. And the parents completely flipped. And because the child was underage, they actually had him committed. So the devotee sat in the institution for a few days, and then finally the doctor came to interview him. And, you know, a typical young devotee said, oh, you know, Vaikuntha, Krishna's blue, Maha, you know, the whole Mahavishnu. We were reading the other day about Matsya Avatar, and the prayer was at the lotus feet of Matsya Avatar. You know, the fish incarnate at lotus feet. So, you know, so devotee just lay it all on people sometimes. And this devotee had evidently laid it all on his parents. So the parents had, in their own, you know, what he, what he understood, what he said, what they understood, and what they translated to the doctor. You can understand what finally happened. So when the doctor said, you know, are you hearing voices? Are you seeing things? And the devotee said, well, I don't see things, but I don't see what you see. So the doctor, you know, stroking his beard, says, hmm, you know, they all, you ask inquisitively, well how, well, how does that make you feel, or what do you mean? And the devotee, they were sitting in the atrium outside, you know, with the with steel bars and everything, but still there was an atrium. And the devotees, was, they were sitting at a table, and there was a, there was a vase of flowers on the table. And the devotee said, well, just like you see these flowers, and you think, oh, let me take these home and woo my girlfriend or, you know, seduce my wife or whatever it may be. Or you, you know, you, you think like that. He said, but I don't think like that. He said, I see that this is simply a transitory, you know, a river of names, it's a composite of earth, fire, water, air, ether, like that. It's combined in this temporary form of flowers, and in due course of time, in the river of time, it will change. But at least, and so on one hand, it has no value. But if that temporary thing is utilized in the service of the Lord, if I take this and offer it to the Supreme Lord as an act of devotion, then that temporary thing, which has no reality on one hand, has eternal benefit. And the, the psychiatrist dropped his pipe looked at him and said, you are the first sane men I have ever met. He said, you're not crazy. He said, you're the first sane person I've met. And so he said, you shouldn't be here. So I'm in bed. How did you get, I'm going to sign you out. They went up to the counter and they started, it's a true story. They started to sign out the devotee. At that time, the father arrived on the scene to see how his son was doing. You know, he's, who he thought was, you know, committed and locked up in the gray hotel. So the he saw his son standing with the doctor, obviously having a happy conversation. The doctor said, I've just spent some time with your son. I think we've made a major breakthrough here. And your son's not crazy at all, and I'm releasing him immediately. And the father began having panic attack, hyperventilating. The father said, the psychiatrist said, you know, you seem to have an undue attachment. And, you're having, you know, and they locked up the father for observation for 24 hours because they thought he was having a heart attack. So the son went and the father stayed. So, but this ability to see that, you know, this is the material nature and I am something different. I mentioned the other day, but it's stuck in my mind because I've been going back and forth with Jadwe Tamarsh. I'm usually at the free food booth at the LA Rathiatra. If you ever want to have a wonderful experience, just sit in the free food booth in Los Angeles Rathiatra. It says there's 400,000 human species. And it was never a doubt. I mean, it's in the Bhagavatam, I accept. But, you know, that's a lot of variation. But if you're at the L.A. Rathiatra, Venice Beach, you'll see, you'll see, it's possible. You'll see every possible range, you know. And they're all coming wave after wave to take prasadam. It's just fantastic, you know. So, what was I going to, oh, but I like to slip out sometimes. And they used to, they used to be set up, they free, the question and answer booth was right nearby. Jai Dwayne was in the question and answer booth. 
And he was making this, you know, because he's a powerful speaker. He said the cornerstone, the, the, the threshold, the beginning principle of all spiritual understanding is that we are not this body. And standing in the back of the crowd were these two large ladies. They were land whales, I'm sorry. They were big. And the one turned to the other one and said, you know, when Marge said, we are not this body, the one turned to her friend and said, boy, that's a relief. And the fact of the matter is that I'm not this body. To understand, wait, there's the, you know, you, we know the, the example, I don't want to take up your time, but you know, the chariot and the senses and the horse and the, you know, all of, that's that, that gift of a gap. That gift to think, wait a minute, just like Christian, conditions, will the conditions make you happy? But it says lust burns like fire, is never satisfied. And we know the sequence from, from attachment comes lust, lust, you know, bewilderment of memory, and intelligence is lost when it falls. In. So if one can have that fail-safe mechanism, that gap, that is a great gift. And with that gap, one can become tolerant, which is the other thing I wanted to talk about. Prabhupada said the measure of a person's strength is, there's that guy who can, not Jack LaLanne, who can pull a tr train with his teeth. Is he the guy who could do that? Ben Quarters. I mean, you know, it's so, all right, it's so fine. Well, you can open beer bottles. I mean, what's what it going to do for you? But, but the, what is the actual measure of a person's strength, Prabhupada said? It's the ability to tolerate. The ability, whatever the senses are agitating, and one simply tolerates. This is not my real business. This is not my real self-interest. So a society that can train uh, Prabhupada said one of, the, one of the purposes of the Gurukula, Prabhupada said it's one of the greatest gifts a parent can give the child, their child, is the ability to tolerate. Instead of training them as you know, these lusty little demons, gimme, 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 I want, I want, and the goal of life is to accumulate. If they can simply learn, of course they should learn devotion, but as a corollary of that, you know, a subset, if they can learn tolerance, just tolerate. And in the Bhagavatam, there's different examples. There's different flavors of tolerance, what it means. So the Bhagavatam in that uh, enlightenment from the natural path and also in light of the Bhagavat, uh, you know, uh, autumn season, it gives the example that for tolerance, one can meditate on the earth. And the meditation on the earth for understanding tolerance is the earth carries so much weight. Somebody was telling me what it is, but so much weight, and it simply remains steady in its orbit. And... Components of the earth are mountains. And the mountain is standing and the storms are beating on it. There's a guy in Lake Palomar, the Laguna Mountains in San Diego, because the storms hit so hard there, he's been hit by lightning three times. You'd think you'd learn to go inside, but that's another story. So, and Prabhupada says, even though the mountain is being pounded on, that pain that it's receiving in the form of the storm, it converts into, into rivers, and those rivers flow, and fertilize and, and you know, water all the, everything on the plains. So Prabhupada said tolerance doesn't mean just to suck it up and tolerate, but it also means to continue giving. It continues to give. This is the nature of a saintly person. And Prabhupada compares it also as one of the byproducts of the earth as a tree. The tree is giving shade, the tree is giving fruit and flowers, even though it's, it's just standing and it's tolerating. People are carving on it so many things. So if one can learn this gift of gap and one can learn tolerance, these are great gifts to fight the age of Kali. And I wanted to say one last thing because we're getting towards the end. Um, and because we're here in San Diego, ah, uh, here in San Diego, here in Dallas, I wanted to tell one Tamal Krishnamar story, which he told me personally. The, this ability to have tolerance, this ability to have that sense of aloofness, not indifference, but aloofness. There's a, there's a, there's a nuance of difference, an important nuance. This is a matter of perspective. So in the enlightenment from the national path, we can learn something from the spider. And what we learn from the spider is how the whole web emanates and is drawn back. Emanates and drawn back. So in a similar way, this whole creation, everything we see, is simply one breath of Mahavishnu. One breath emanates and comes back. So the Tamal Krishnamaraj story is that Tamal Krishnamaraj, and he told me this personally, so I, I can say it. Um, he had just been appointed by Srila Prabhupada as the temple commander of the Los Angeles temple. 
Now, at that time in the Los Angeles Temple, we had, there were maybe 30 devotees at that time. And there was no, you know, householder community. Now in, in Los Angeles, you've got, you know, you've got your core temple devotees, and then you've got, you know, a huge congregation of all, all different ranges of devotees and levels of commitment. But in those days, you were in or you were out. So we, we had about 30 devotees. It was the biggest temple in Yiscon. And Tamal Krishmar said to Prabhupada, I have this new position as temple commander. And it's very important. And I'm afraid that I will become arrogant or puffed up with this new position. So what to do? Please protect me. Like Lord Brahma praying to Krishna, please protect me. So Prabhupada said, you simply think like this. You think that Mahavishnu, one exhale. And in his breath, so many universes are being created. You know, all the bubbles. And in every universe, so many planets. Every planet, so many continents. Every continent, so many countries. Every country, so many states. Every state, so many cities. Every city, so many blocks, so many streets, and so many houses. And in one of those houses is Tamal Krishnamar's thinking, I'm very important. So if we can keep that gift of perspective, that will also help us be tolerant. And whatever comes, all right, whatever it is, you know, we can tolerate. My real business, let me do my real business of becoming Krishna conscious. Uh, one last thing is that uh, I was just listening to a tape, and Prabhupada says, just out of the, sometimes Prabhupada come out of these things just out of the blue, you know? So Prabhupada's walking, and all of a sudden he says, Devotees don't suffer. Now, this was the first Mayapur pilgrimage where by that time, you know, 80% of the devotees had been laid low, you know, we're just. Out like, as far as the devotees don't suffer. There's this long pause. You can hear the you can hear Prabhupada's cane. You can hear the devotees walking. Everybody's like, "All right, Prabhupada said it. Uh, devotees don't suffer." And then finally, you hear Pancha Devita Maharaj, who had a nice had this kind of relation with Prabhupada. He says, "Well, Prabhupada, uh, if the devotees don't suffer, what exactly are we doing? You know, because you can look like you know you could call it suffering. You know, and Prabhupada, you know, immediately picking up. You hear Prabhupada laugh." And then Prabhupada said, that's all right. But after this life, back home, back to Godhead. And Prabhupada says in that one purport, the mind suffers for the want of a, of a final goal. And Prabhupada flips it over and Prabhupada says, you can tolerate anything if you know for, it's for a fixed period of time. All right, fine. I, I can be with my mother-in-law. I know it's an hour. Okay, fine, whatever. Is this taped? <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> well, this is going to be a hot time. I'm like, no, no. My mother-in-law is long gone by Krishna's grace. Hare Krishna. Hey, oh, made another friend. <laughs> anyway, um, where were we going to go with that? Um, ah, oh, you can tolerate, you can tolerate. So Prabhupada said devotees don't suffer. Um, because they know that at the end of this life, back home, back to Godhead. Like, just whatever comes on me, I'll just do my duty serve my spiritual master, serve the conditioned souls, and go back home, back to God, and finish with this whole thing, you know? So I was just thinking, there's the, because um, I'm supposed to, this is people expected of me, so I'll tell one joke and then one story from Prabhupada, and we'll end. Um, because always disturbed, and what people are disturbed by is these unlimited desires that can never be satisfied and burn like fire. So two stories about desires. And excuse me, I know jokes about men, jokes about women, so ladies, please don't take offense. This is the one that applies now. Um, man is walking down the beach. Stubs his toe, looks down, sees something shiny, polishes it, finds a lamp. Polishes the lamp. Sure enough, a genie comes out, says, you have one wish. The man says, you know, my family lives in Hawaii. I have to work here in California. And I have to fly back and forth. It's very expensive. Can you just build me a bridge? And I'll just drive. Genie says, have you lost your mind? I'm, I'm, I'm a genie, but come, you know, come on. You know, you know how much cement that's going to take, how long it's going to take? You know, ask for something else. So the man says, well, you know, I got this mother-in-law. I got my wife. I've got kids. You know, how do you make, how do you understand the woman and make her happy? And the genie responds, when do you want that bridge by? <laughs> ha, ha, ha. 
So what to do with one wish? Is, that was the setup. What to do with the one wish? The one wish is, and this is Prabhupada's story. A man is blind. How does it go? Blind, poverty-stricken, and no children. And a pious person actually wants to have children. Uh, you know, family life. You know, and this one's very renowned. That's another thing. But. So this blind, poverty-stricken, and no children. And he only is allowed one wish. And you cannot wish for unlimited wishes. Sorry, folks. That's out. So one wish. What does the person wish for? He wishes to see his children from the roof of his palace. See his children from the roof of his palace. It means that everything's satisfied by one wish, you know? So Prabhupada gave the example that that one wish is just become Krishna conscious. If we just become Krishna conscious, we're freed from the symptoms of Kali. And not only that, because Prabhupada says the symptom, the, the essence, when that, there's that fight between Vishamrita and Vishishtamuni, and he uh, was it? Uh, Vishamrita was a king who wanted to become a Brahmin. And there's a whole story throughout the Mahabharata, it's in the Ramayana, so many things. And finally, does anyone know the quality he developed? He did all kinds of tapasya, he did so many things. Developed all kinds of cities, profound knowledge. Never got the coronation from the Devas, you're now qualified as a Brahmin. What is the one quality he developed that he became crowned, now you're a Brahmin? Compassion. When he finally realized, I put Vashishta Muni through so, so much difficulty, for what? And he felt remorse and repentance, and said, what is all this? And he felt compassion, then the Deva showered flowers and said, you're now qualified as a Brahmin. So if we could just, and I'm speaking to myself, of course, develop compassion, develop that aloofness, that detachment, and develop tolerance, and do good for others. That one wish will satisfy everything. So we should end there. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. And now it's breakfast. What's not the love about the Hare Krishna movement? <laughs>